Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Clinical and Imaging Biomarkers in Parkinsonian Syndromes. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel, and that's found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Exico who developed the content for this presentation. Exico is a premier neuroimaging provider helping biopharmaceutical companies maximize the value of their drug development pipelines by transforming data into clinical meaningful insights. Bringing together breakthrough AI innovations, deep neuroscience expertise, and operational excellence, Exico enables clients to realize the full power of neuroimaging in CNS clinical trials. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for today's webinar. And first, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Horatio Kaufman. He is a professor at the Department of Neurology at the NYU School of Medicine. Horatio is one of the world's foremost experts and a leader in the field of autonomic disorders, including Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. His research focuses on the autonomic nervous system and its abnormalities in neurological disorders, and he has conducted innovative clinical trials of the main drugs used in the treatment of these disorders. And next we have Dr. Heba Cosme. She's the Associate Biomarker Scientist at Exico. Heba currently works, as a, uh, works across a range of therapeutic areas, including Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, and Alzheimer's disease. Her PhD investigated the presence of clinical and imaging features associated with prodromal Parkinson's disease in patients with late onset depression. She also has experience in clinical settings, including working with patients with psychiatric disorders such as depression and schizophrenia. Now, it's my pleasure to pass over the mic and the controls over to our first speaker, Horatio. So Horatio, when you're ready, you may begin. Hi, good morning, good afternoon for those in Europe. <clears throat> my name is Horacio Kaufman, and the title of my talk, my goal here is to talk about Parkinsonian syndromes, a clinical introduction and diagnostic challenges. Now, um, see this book. The main points I want to make in the, in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes is that Parkinsonism is a movement disorder not always due to Parkinson's disease. There are many neurological disorders present or that present with similar movement abnormalities. And the, although the differential diagnosis is still mostly clinical between these different disorders, both imaging and weight biomarkers, that is CSF and blood, have an emerging role to diagnose and also to track disease progression. Now, what is Parkinsonism? Well, Parkinsonism is a, is a clinical syndrome, is a characteristic clinical syndrome that can be uh, recognized quite quickly just by observation, like you see in this figure, the flex post posture, the tremor, and the rigidity. Now, this was first described, this clinical syndrome, by James Parkinson's in 1817 in his seminal essay. And he just watched three of his own patients and actually three people that were not his patients, but that he saw in the streets of the city. Now, almost 70 years later, Charcot in France, in his Tuesday lessons, first referred to this syndrome as Parkinson's disease or the disease of James Parkinson's. 
These are his, his original drawings describing the typical posture and face in patients with Parkinsonism. Now, it took almost a century or a hundred years for Ehringer, uh, who was a young graduate and working in the lab of Hornikiewicz in Germany, to show that in patients that had died with Parkinson's disease, dopamine, which was, had recently been described as a potential neurotransmitter by Carlson, uh, that dopamine was severely depleted in the striatum of patients with Parkinson's disease. And the striatum meaning these two nuclei, the caudate and the putamen. This, of course, um, opened the, the, the path to Cotias in 1967 to reverse uh, this clinical syndrome with the precursor of dopamine called L-DOPA. What you see in this graph, of course, is the substantia nigra, where the neurons that have dopamine have the cell bodies, where they originate to innervate the striatum. Now, can I play the video now? Sonia? If the disease involves both substantia nigra, there is difficulty in correcting posture when suddenly displaced. This man literally falls backwards when he is lightly pushed. In a healthy subject, rapid passive stretching of a muscle is a smooth movement. In the patient, the stretching is interrupted and is called cogwheel. The volitional movements in the patient are definitely slower than those in the healthy subject. When the patient's hand is placed on his leg, a regular tremor develops in his fingers, thumb and at the wrist. This tremor is likened to pill rolling. As he walks towards us, the steps are short. The gait is somewhat shuffling. The patient turns slowly. and he sits down awkwardly in a lump. Okay. Can, can I have the controls back? Okay, thank you. I hope you saw that movie. That, of course, is a movie from the 1950s and um, recognizing Parkinson's disease at that stage, as you saw in the movie, uh, that shows the characteristic features is, is quite easy. Now, in the, this was from the 50s, where are we now? We are in the 21st century, and the era now, I would call it the alpha-synuclein and the prodromal era. Why is that? Because in the late 1990s, it was uh, firmly discovered that it is the accumulation of a misfolded protein called alpha-synuclein in the nervous system, which is the, the hallmark or the cause of Parkinson's disease and other Parkinsonism, although not all of them. And based on this discovery that this is a progressive neuronal degeneration, it came the recognition that there are a number of prodromal premotor stages where uh, patients do not present with the picture you just saw in the video. Actually, they present with much restricted phenotypes and some of them that were uh, discovered very recently. For example, impaired sense of smell, acting out dreams called REM sleep behavior disorder, or abnormalities of the autonomic nervous system, particularly a falling blood pressure upon standing called orthostatic hypotension.
Now, these symptoms predict the development, and with quite accurately, the development in a few years of a typical Parkinsonian syndrome. And why is that? Well, because alpha-synuclein-mediated neurodegeneration doesn't start in the nigra on the basal ganglia. It starts in the olfactory bulb and in areas of the brainstem uh, that are involved in the control on the paralysis that occurs during REM sleep. And when they are affected, uh, REM behavior disorder occurs. Now, not only this occurs in the brain, but interestingly, it also occurs, this accumulation of synuclein in the peripheral nervous system, in the autonomic peripheral nervous system, in the vagus, in the myenteric plexus, sympathetic ganglia, and parasympathetic ganglia. So both in the autonomic and the enteric nervous system. Now, what's important and what's the, the main point of my talk is that not all patients with Parkinsonism have Parkinson's disease. Actually, Parkinsonism can be due to neurodegenerative disorders, vascular disorders, or can be drug-induced. In the case of vascular disorders, is cerebral small vessel disease affecting the basal ganglia and drug induces dopamine blockers that block the receptors where dopamine transmission should occur. Now, these two are easily ruled out by history and exam, and we are left with the neurodegenerative Parkinsonism. Now, the neurodegenerative ones are now called proteinopathies, meaning they are due to the abnormal accumulation of different proteins, in fact, two types of proteins within neurons or glia. When the protein is synuclein, one, a, a small 140 amino acids that is normally expressed, but for some reason it misfolds uh, abnormally, that is responsible for Parkinson's disease, Lewy body dementia, or multiple system atrophy. When the accumulation is tau, this other protein is progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, or frontotemporal dementia, Parkinsonism complex. Now, Parkinson's disease, of course, among the synucleinopathies is the most common, is the second most common neurodegenerative disorder after Alzheimer's disease, affects around 1 million people in the US and 60,000 people are diagnosed each year. And there are more than 10 million people worldwide living with Parkinson's disease. Multiple system atrophy um, is much less common. It was first described in 1960 by Shai and Dreger. And what they described were patients with Parkinsonism that in addition had severe autonomic impairment. They had orthostatic hypotension, urinary retention, erectile dysfunction, and decreased sweating. It took a few years to realize that synuclein was also uh, responsible for this disorder, but mostly in, or initially in glial, in oligodendroglial cells. Progressive supranuclear palsy, the other uh, differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism, was described a few years later in 1964 by Steele, Richardson, and Olszewski. The initial report had nine patients. They all had Parkinsonism, but in addition, they had problems with voluntary eye movements. They had a very typical extended rather than uh, flex next box posture, and they would fall backwards, and they also develop cognitive problems. Now, what's the frequency of these uh, different types of Parkinsonism that I just mentioned to you? Well, more than half of Parkinsonism are not due to Parkinson's disease. The numbers I'm showing you here are from Olmsted County. That's a county, a county in uh, Minnesota where the Mayo Clinic is, and they have a long-term study. These are the diagnoses in 10 years within that county. And as you see, 48% were Parkinson's disease, 20% were dementia with Lewy body, 3% were multiple system atrophy, and the rest was divided between PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy, the corticovascular degeneration, drug induced 6%, and um, vascular 2% with unspecified 
So interestingly, there is 16% that is unspecified. Now, how do we make that diagnosis between the different types of Parkinsonism? Well, as I mentioned to you, the diagnosis is still mostly clinical. I'm not gonna go over all the distinction between these four types of Parkinsonism, just going to uh, emphasize a few differences. Multiple system atrophy occurs usually in younger patients from the 50s to the 60s. The life expectancy is the longest in Parkinson's disease, much shorter in the other forms of Parkinsonism. And interestingly, uh, in terms of the rigidity and tremor, while in Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy body, it starts asymmetrically, meaning in one side, usually in multiple system atrophy is bilateral and is the axial muscles in PSP. Uh, the, the tremor, the typical tremor, the pill rolling you saw in the movie, only occurs in Parkinson's and not in the other one. Now, uh, interestingly, olfaction, the sense of smell, is normal in multiple system atrophy and PSP, but is decreased both in the dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease. Other uh, important difference is that PSP is the only um, of these neurodegenerative Parkinsonism that do not have or does not present with orthostatic hypotension, and is the only one that presents with an extended rather than a flex posture. Uh, falls are very common in the atypical ones. They occur much later in Parkinson's disease. And most importantly, only Parkinson's disease has an excellent and sustained uh, response to levodopa, whereas the other Parkinsonism respond either uh, not at all or very mildly. And cognitive dysfunction occurs very early in dementia with Lewy bodies and is very, and also early in PSP, but much later on the other ones. Now, let me um, tell you that despite all these um, clinical differences, um, approximately 25% of uh, patients with Parkinsonism are misdiagnosed when seen by a general neurologist. And approximately 15%, so a little less, are misdiagnosed by the best um, available movement disorder specialist. So it is, it is clear that we need better diagnostic tools that can help us reach a much higher, I mean, the idea will be 100% accuracy while the patients are still alive. So how, how, can we, how can we do that? Well, uh, there are biomarkers in, in development, um, liquid biomarkers, meaning biomarkers you can measure in CSF or blood, the very promising ones, the ones that I put here with high enthusiasm, are the alpha-synuclein oligomerization assays that's the, the real-time uh, or RT, um, RT quick or PCMA. These are very promising because they, this allow, uh, these assays allow getting uh, small amounts of um, um, misfolded synuclein and to aggregate and increase. Then um, the neurofilament light, uh, both in CSF and in plasma, are very promising, not so much for diagnosis, but to track disease progression. There are other um, liquid biomarkers like the exosomes or skin biopsies, which uh, are promising, but still um, not conclusive. Now, all these biomarkers are still in the research setting. On the other hand, the imaging biomarkers, both um, the radionuclide like SPECT and PET and MRI are widely available and there are a good number of studies that show the usefulness of MRI, of magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, both in the differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism with um, very typical um, abnormalities in the atypical Parkinsonism, meaning in MSA and in PSP, and also they are extremely promising to assess disease progression. Now, these are the, um, the issues that um, 
Hiva, Dr. Hiva Kasmi will, will address in, in, in the next talk. So let me just finalize by telling you that what is the future of or what I believe, me and, and, and I think most of the field, that the uh, future of biomarkers in Parkinsonism for clinical trials of disease modifying drugs will require the integration of clinical together with imaging and with biomarkers so that we can identify patients, not when like the ones you saw in the, in the video, but when they are at much earlier stages when their motor abnormalities are almost imperceptible. Of course, this is key for clinical trials uh, for disease prevention or disease uh, modifying. Now, these biomarker signals, of course, would also serve as early efficacy for go, no go decisions for drug uh, candidates. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions and I will pass now the control to Dr. Hiva Kasmi, um, who will, will show you a, a fast, some fascinating uh, results. Hiva, uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman, for that really interesting presentation on the clinical presentation of Parkinsonian syndromes. This leads quite nicely onto what I will be discussing today. Hello, everyone. And in particular, I will be focusing just on Parkinson's disease and really giving an introduction to the current uh, imaging biomarkers that we have, but also some of the slightly more emerging ones. So before I actually um, dive into and start talking about specific imaging techniques, I just wanted to bring up this slide here to really talk about the ways that we can use imaging to enhance clinical trials and also gain a better understanding of the pathology of Parkinson's disease. And there's a few ways we can do that, some of which I've listed here. And in particular, we can use imaging to help with patient selection. And um, this is useful mainly because uh, we, we uh, looking to uh, differentiate between healthy controls and those with Parkinson's disease. We can use imaging for this, but also stratification, such as Horatio mentioned earlier in his slide, um, being able to distinguish between those with MSA, PSP, or PD. Even within Parkinson's disease, there's been research in the past few years, particularly from Borghammer and colleagues, where they've identified subtypes within Parkinson's disease. Now, I've included an image from one of their papers here from 2019. And what they've really identified here that we have patients that present with brain first Parkinson. So this begins in the brain and then proceeds down to the rest of the body. But we also have body first Parkinson, whereby the pathology begins in the gut and actually precedes the pathology in the brain. And this is where it's really important to be able to use imaging and certainly a range of imaging biomarkers to be able to distinguish between these very specific subtypes as well. Imaging is also useful when looking at clinical trials that are focusing on subjects in the prodromal stage. So again, as Dr. Kaufman mentioned, these are patients that have not clinically been diagnosed yet with Parkinson's disease, but they are presenting with REM sleep behavior disorder, for example. And certainly there have been studies that have found um, imaging uh, in particular uh, in, in these patients, they are still presenting with pathology associated with Parkinson's disease, even at this early stage. Secondly, we can use imaging to look at disease progression. And certainly at the moment in terms of clinical trials, we do have um, an increase of symptomatic therapies versus disease modifying therapies. But this is where imaging is really key in particular in these disease modifying therapies to be able to assess progression. Thirdly, we can also use imaging to look at the efficacy and the safety of a drug. This is particularly useful in these early phase trials where we are exploring new drugs and to be able to use imaging to look for any, um, any concerning results or even understand a little bit better about the dosing. I wanted to also uh, briefly touch upon a few of the challenges that we face, in particular when looking at these slightly newer techniques and also a little bit later on where I, where I will be talking about disease progression. And in particular, what we're really looking for is making sure we have validation of quantification approaches and we're able to accurately delineate um, particular regions of interest such as the substantia nigra which also has subregions. Secondly it's also important 
that we are able to better establish longitudinal imaging studies. This is through having larger studies, even more multi-site studies, to help us really gain an understanding of how these more emerging and advanced MRI markers work. So on to the next slide. So here I've just um, summed up the imaging techniques that are commonly used in Parkinson's disease. And I've really split this into those more traditional techniques and those more emerging. And what's quite interesting with Parkinson's disease is, unlike um, other neurodegenerative disorders such as PSP, MSA, or even Alzheimer's disease, an MRI is not particularly useful at this early diagnostic stage. What is really useful is the use of SPECT or PET imaging, and in particular, looking at the dopamine transporter. And this in particular, I will be talking about a little bit later on. In terms of PET, I've also mentioned a list of other neurotransmitters. Also, it's useful to look at glucose metabolism, which I think really highlights Parkinson's disease as a multifactorial disorder. I have included MRI, but this is again more useful from a safety perspective or being used alongside that spect. So we have these established diagnostic markers, and there is more interest in now looking at the disease progression and what markers we can, what can be markers can be useful there in Parkinson's disease. And this is where we move on to these more emerging advanced MRI markers. And certainly in a research setting in, a, in academia, these, have, these techniques have long been explored. And in industry, we are now seeing a handful of studies that are also starting to explore the use of these markers to look at progression. Finally, I will also be talking a little bit about the use of multimodal imaging. So not just focusing on the use of one biomarker, but actually a combination. So I really wanted to start off with by talking about the use of uh, DATSPECT. Now dopamine is obviously a really uh, key uh, pathology in the brain and it's been really looked at uh, significantly and in terms of the most approved way to assess this and specifically by looking at the nigrostriatal pathway which I've highlighted in blue here, we usually have a DAT scan to look at the striatum. Now the striatum consists of the putamen and the chordate. And usually when we have what we call a DAT spec scan, or in particular using this DAT scan, which has been approved by both the FDA and the EMA, we are presented with these images. And I will just talk through these a little bit so we get a little bit more of an understanding of how the um, pathology presents in the brain when we are looking at a DAT scan. So in particular, we have the first image, and you can see that there's sort of um, a full comma shape on the left and right hand side of the striatum. So this is indicative of a normal uptake in both the chordate and the putamen. We can't see any evidence of any dopaminergic deficit. The next three images are actually patients which are presenting with Parkinson's disease. So we have what we call abnormal type 1. And in this patient, I pointed out on the right-hand side, there's a decrease in the uptake, in particular in the putamen. So we've really lost the uptake in that tail. And this patient would be presenting with contralateral symptoms. So on the left-hand side, they would be presenting with their symptoms. But certainly as the disease progresses, this becomes more bilateral. We also have abnormal type 2. Now these are patients where the uptake in the putamen has completely, um, there's a complete deficit there and it's only confined to the chordate nuclei. Finally, we have abnormal type 3. Now this is a patient where we can see a real increase in background activity. It's really hard to distinguish the uptake in the chordate or the putamen. And these are typically the uh, signs that we would see in patients that are presenting with Parkinson's disease. Now, as I mentioned, this has been approved by the FDA and the EMA. In particular, this is to help with a clinical diagnosis. So initially, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, the gold standard is to do a clinical diagnosis. If there's uncertainty, then it is useful to have a DAT scan. In particular, if someone is presenting with essential tremor, for example, if they were to have a DAT scan, their DAT scan would be normal. Another use of the use of DATSCAN, and in particular in clinical trials, is that it's also been approved as of a few years ago by the EMA and the FDA as an enrichment biomarker. And this is for the exclusion of subjects that we call sweats. Now, these are patients that present with Parkinson's disease, but they do not have any evidence of a dopaminergic deficit. And this could be due to the fact that their pathology is slightly different, they are slightly more slower progressing, and for the use in clinical trials, it's important that we are able to really disentangle these subtypes and perhaps include, depending on the trial, only those subjects that present with more typical pathology. One thing I wanted to point out 
that that scan is not useful to distinguish between Parkinsonian syndromes. So patients with MSA, PSP and Parkinson's disease will all present with some deficit. And it's particularly useful in the early stages of the disease. So as I've mentioned in the, from a diagnostic perspective, but even looking at progression at these early stages. Now I've obviously been talking specifically about the, um, the GAT scan tracer, the 123 FPCIT, but I also wanted to point out that there are actually a range of SPEC and PET tracers that are available that are all also allow us to assess the integrity of the presynaptic pathway. Uh, these have not been approved by the FDA in the EUA, but we can see from the images that I've provided here that they all present with very similar patterns of uptake. So we can see on the top row, these are using different traces and we can see these are healthy controls, whereas in the bottom row, we are seeing patients presenting with Parkinson's disease. Another thing I wanted to point out is that I've listed, we have the traces listed on the top, but at the bottom, we can see that they are actually targeting slightly different areas. So some of the first three images are looking at the dopamine transporter in particular, as I described in the last slide. But we also have a tracer which can look at VMAT, also FDOPA specifically focuses on dopamine synthesis. And it's important to point out, whilst all these scans can help us assess the integrity of this pathway, they are looking at slightly different processes. For example, when using FDOPA at the beginning of uh, a subject's diagnosis, they will actually have upregulation. Whereas when using a DAT scan, there will be slightly more down regulation as it's a compensatory mechanism. Now within PET and SPEC, there are pros and cons of using both. SPEC is more readily available, it's less expensive, and we have less of an issue with half-life. However, PET can provide higher resolution and better quantitative capacity as well. Now I've provided an example here of a tracer, the 18FEPE2I DAT PET tracer. So again, it actually looks at the dopamine transporter. And we can see already there's far more improved resolution. There's also convenience from a patient's perspective in that a thyroid blocking agent is not required before using the scan. And secondly, and thirdly, there are actually also thought to be shorter injection to scan times and acquisition times as well. So certainly it is a promising uh, tracer to look at the dopamine transporter. Now, before I move on, to the more emerging techniques, I just wanted to bring up this slide here, which really was just a quick search um, that through clinicaltrials.gov, which really looked at the use of MRI over the past few years. And we can see there has been a steady increase in the use of MRI alone or, as a, or, or with another non-MR technique. Now, certainly this may be the case because of the increase in trials that we've had, but I think it's also interesting because it highlights the use of also using non dat spec or PET techniques and really helping us understand more about the pathology of PD and really identifying these subtypes and actually really using a combination of markers to help us gain a better understanding. So with that, I wanted to move on to the use of these more advanced MRI techniques. And in particular, I've been talking about uh, the striatum, specifically looking at the dopaminergic terminal function but I now want to turn your attention to looking at the substantia nigra in particular. And this is the orange area that I've highlighted. Now, Dr. Kaufman mentioned in his presentation as well, in particular, this is the area that includes the dopamine cells, and it actually supplies the striatum with dopamine. Now, it consists of two areas. In particular, it consists of the substantia nigra pars compactor. This area supplies the striatum with dopamine, and we also have the substantia nigra pars reticular, which supplies to the rest of the brain. And in particular, we can use neuromelanin imaging to help us really look at the integrity of this area. Now, the dopaminergic neurons on this are rich in this neuromelanin pigment, which presents um, histopathologically as a dark area, but we can see in, this, in the images I've provided here, it's this hyperintense region. And there's been uh, studies for quite a few years which have found high accuracy with reduced neuromelanin signals and volume in this particular area in those with Parkinson's disease. Um, versus those with versus healthy controls. As well as distinguishing between these groups, there's also been papers, in particular a very recent paper by Goravatel this year, which they also found there was a longitudinal change over two years of neuromelanin signal, which could be detected in those patients with Parkinson's disease. And we can see in the image here that I've uh, taken from that paper, we're looking at a healthy control on the top 
Um, on the top row at baseline, a patient with early Parkinson's disease and a patient with progressing PD. And if we look to the bottom row, we can see in the follow-up, the two-year follow-up, a healthy control, we can still see that hyperintense region. There's not a reduction in neuromelanin. In those with early PD, there's less, slightly more of a reduction. And those in progressing, it's really hard to, to really see that hyperintense signal anymore. So certainly it seems like a promising marker to be longitudinally looking at the loss of dopamine in this area. Furthermore, there have also been studies that have shown associations between the motor symptoms, so the UPDRS scores, and also a decrease in contrast ratios. And typically, we can look at contrast ratios, we can also look at volume. It is uh, important to point out that whilst this is a very promising technique, some of the studies have been slightly small or used different sequences, so there definitely is a need for more multi-site studies and larger studies as well, but certainly it's promising. Next, I wanted to, again, focusing on the substantia nigra, but look at iron imaging. Now, excessive iron is thought to contribute to neuronal death. In particular, with those with Parkinson's disease, they have an increase of iron. And there's actually a relationship between iron and neuromelanin in that the accumulation of iron, when it's not stored in neuromelanin, it's thought may contribute to the neurodegeneration in Parkinson's disease. In terms of how this presents, in terms of scans, we can use an SWI scan, which is the image I've shown here, which actually gives us a visual assessment of how the images would look. And in particular, just to point your attention to the image here, I've shown the image of a healthy control, and you can see they have this distinctive swallowtail design of, uh, of iron deposits, which is a normal, which is normal, it's a healthy control. However, if we move down to the image below, this is a patient with Parkinson's disease, and you can really see the increase in iron um, versus the control. Now, this is a visual assessment, but there are also um, R2 star imaging and QSM, which is slightly newer, allows us to look for quantification as well, to look at more of the details and perhaps to assess change. In terms of research, it's been a little bit mixed in terms of looking at the correlation between the severity of motor symptoms. There has been some research which has pointed towards the use of R2 star, which is found to correlate with some symptoms. But uh, in terms of longitudinal, there's been less research, but it's more from a diagnostic perspective. It's definitely able to distinguish between those with Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. Also, there has found to be increased iron content in the substantia nigra, even with patients who are, again, in their really early stages of the disease, so those with REM sleep behavior disorder. Again, with iron imaging, we are presented um, with, similar, uh, with similar things to improve on, such as neuromelanin, in terms of having these more larger studies um, to be able to uh, compare the results. Finally, I wanted to talk about diffusion and in particular free water imaging, which is thought to be particularly sensitive to um, assess a tissue structure and demonstrate neurodegeneration. And again, we're focusing on the same area, the substantia nigra. And in particular, it's been thought that proposed cellular alterations due to, again, iron accumulation in this area actually changes the cellularity and in turn increases the fluid content in this area. And this has been, um, uh, th this has been supported by research which has found that there has been an increase in, in free water content in this area in patients with Parkinson's disease versus healthy controls. In particular, a paper by Afori from a few years ago, they found that this was also able to predict changes in bradykinesia and even cognitive status. So, water imaging really seems promising in terms of not only looking at progression but also perhaps even being able to predict changes. Furthermore, similar to iron imaging, it's also been found that even with patients in this really early stage, it's thought to be useful. So over here I wanted to just focus a little bit more on the use of multimodal imaging. So I've obviously described um, the use of SPECT and these advanced techniques on their own. However, it is very important to really look at a combination of these modalities and focus on dopamine, but also non-dopaminergic measures as well. And there's been quite a few papers that have been published that are actually looking at a combination of these techniques and finding these processes that are happening parallel to each other, but we are only able to see these through the use of different imaging. And whilst we're on the topic of talking about uh, sort of advanced and newer techniques, I also wanted to point out that recently um, the AC Immune received funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to actually investigate alpha-synuclein, um, which would again add to, again, use with multimodal imaging, can really present us with some really interesting results and a better understanding.
the use of uh, longitudinal imaging um, and longitudinal results is really what we need here and what's really key to help us understand which markers are particularly useful in which subtypes of patients and, to, and when to assess progression. And in particular, longitudinal databases such as the PPMI are really able to provide us with informative literature on disease progression. In particular, in the past few years, they've been able to release uh, results from four years. And again, it's looking at free water imaging, finding an increase of free water in those with Parkinson's disease, even the use of volumetric F F M uh, MRI. With these authors actually suggesting that um, using MRI means that it's less likely to be affected by symptomatic treatment, but also to not have this potential floor effect, which is now being suggested with the use of longitudinal DAT spec. In terms of in terms of that sense, so as I mentioned in the early stages, particularly useful, but there has been a paper in 2018 which has suggested it's particularly useful in the first year, and by year four, there seems to be this potential flooring effect. So I just really wanted to conclude now, and in terms of the use of imaging, certainly imaging the integrity of the dopaminergic terminal really remains key from a diagnostic perspective, but even when really looking at the early stages of clinical trials. With advanced imaging techniques, so far they really are providing us with really interesting insights in terms of potentially assessing disease progression and also for diagnostic purposes. However, what the next steps that we really need, we require larger and longer multi-site studies and also more of a consensus among imaging protocols. There are various sequences that can be used and in particular it's important to have some sort of consensus in order to compare the results accurately. And finally, and also to Dr. Kaufman's point, what's really important here is the use of multimodal imaging and non-imaging biomarkers. These are really key to improving our understanding of Parkinson's disease and really have the potential to play a key role in clinical trials to measure progression, drug efficacy, and also help identify the pathology of these subtypes of PD. That's the end of my talk, and I will hand it over to you now, Sonia. Yeah, so thank you very much for that. I'm now going to take back the controls and we're going to begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to thank you, Horatio and Hiba, for that very insightful and detailed presentation. And we'll put on our webcams and there is Horatio. Now here I am. There we go. Okay. Now I just want to remind the audience to please continue to send in your questions by using that questions window and we'll try to attend to your questions during the time we have together. I've already received some questions already from our audience members, so I'm going to begin with those. So uh, Horatio and Hiba, are you ready? Here is our first question. All right. Thank you. Uh, this question looks like it might be for you, Horatio. Uh, this audience member is asking, you discuss recognition of the prodromal stages. How early can these symptoms appear in PD, MSA, and PSP? Okay. Clinically, the, these, these phenotypes or these clinical symptoms appear years before uh, motor symptoms. Now, I, I presume the, um, that's clinically or with other biomarkers like measuring olfaction or um, measuring sinuclein or some other biomarker. But the issue is how early MRI of the brain can show abnormalities. Well, that's an area of very uh, intense research and we, we hope it's going to be earlier than when the motor symptoms are present. And the example that Hiva gave us was abnormalities already in the nigrostriatal pathway in patients that do not have motor symptoms, but they only have REM behavior disorder. So in REM behavior disorder that has been done and is currently being done in patients that have autonomic abnormalities alone, like in pure autonomic failure to see whether the signs of Parkinsonism in the brain are already there. So the short answer is we are not sure, but it may be much earlier than we think. Thank you very much, Horatio. Now here's our next question. This audience member is asking, any biomarkers and imaging specifically for MSA? Um, you know, yes, there, there, there are. I'm, I'm jumping here. The, the expert really is, is Dr. Kasmi. But as opposed to Parkinson's disease, that there is still um, some argument, even regular MRIs are abnormal in patients with 
atypical Parkinsonism. There is atrophy of the striatum and um, there's atrophy of the pons and the middle cerebral pit ankle in multiple system atrophy. Whereas for example, in PSP, the atrophy is more in the midbrain or the mesencephalon. So, uh, and there are a number of other signs like the hot cross band sign that allow us to, with a regular MRI, distinguish uh, between Parkinsonism. And here you could probably clarify more on that, things like uh, this Parkinsonism ratio in which, uh, which is so useful to distinguish MSA from PSP, for example. Yes, certainly. And it's definitely the use of MRI in particular um, which uh, just particularly useful in MSA and PSP, as you mentioned, and we have the MRPI, so the, uh, the index, and also the midbrain to pons ratio, which is particularly useful um, and looks at specific areas of the brain to calculate this ratio in order to gain a better understanding of um, whether we're looking at MSA or PSP. Perfect. So that's available now. That, that can be done now, which is important to realize that for the differential diagnosis of Parkinsonism, MRI imaging is crucial. And of course, this is a crucial point for clinical trials. So we do not want to include patients with MSA in trials of Parkinson's disease. And we don't want to include patients with Parkinson's in trials with MSA. And the distinction uh, requires MRI. Okay, Men thank you. Thank you both for answering that question. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question now. Uh, this audience member is asking, is a visual read the primary assessment of the DAT scan or is quantification also utilize, uh, utilized rather? Uh, who would like to start with that, Hiba or Horatio? Hiba is the expert on that. Okay, I, thank I you very much. Um, so from a diagnostic point of view, a visual assessment really is the key. So similar to the images that I presented, and, and usually we're able to see a deficit vis visually quite easily. Quantitative analysis can be used um, in particular for exploratory purposes or if we're looking at longitudinal change, so to be able to look at these quantitative values over time. It may also be particularly useful when looking at these patients in the prodromal stage where you're really looking for small differences. And similar to the visual assessment, we would be looking at um, straight binding ratios, for example, in the chordate and the putamen, and perhaps using the occipital lobe as a reference region. Okay, thank you very much. Horatio, did you want to add anything to that? No, just um, the same things that Hiva mentioned that is very useful to distinguish um, essential tremor uh, or, or drug-induced Parkinsonism from Parkinson's disease, but unfortunately it cannot distinguish, like Hiva mentioned, between different Parkinsonisms because they are all abnormal. The DAT scan is abnormal in all of them, mm -hmm. okay. even in class. Okay, all right. Thank you very much for answering that question. Here's the next question. This may be for you, Horatio. Uh, this audience member is asking, what would you say are the biggest challenges when recruiting patients for MSA and PSP trials? Well, in, in terms of, um, I, I would say, is to find patients early on where we can be certain of the diagnosis. And perhaps the biggest challenge is between Parkinson's disease with orthostatic hypotension, which is up to 50% of the patients, or 30 to 50%, and patients with multiple system atrophy, particularly initially, that phenotypically, meaning clinically and even laboratory-wise, uh, can be very similar. So MSA versus PD is perhaps the biggest challenge. And for, for uh, PSP, I would say is the, is the same story, uh, to make certain that patients really have PSP as opposed to um, MSA or some atypical um, regular Parkinson's. Okay, so thank you. Crucial. Imaging is crucial for, for clinical trials. Okay, thank you very much, Horatio, for that. Here's the next question. This looks like it may be for you, Hiba. Uh, you mentioned that DAT spec is not useful to differentiate between Parkinsonian syndromes. Aside from structural MR, are there any other modalities that can? 
Yes, so there, there, there's been a little bit of research using um, looking at FDG PET, so looking at glucose metabolism, and um, there, there's been uh, reports that there are specific um, patterns of glucose metabolism, certainly associated with Parkinson's disease, known as the PDRP, but also specific patterns uh, specific to MSA and PSP. So it seems that this could be a potential marker as well, where we're able to distinguish between these disorders. There's also been um, some research from 2014 where the use of neuromelanin was also um, reported to be able to distinguish with high accuracy between those with PSP, MSA, and Parkinson's disease. Rachel, I don't know if you um, can add more with that in terms of the, the PSP and the MSA differentiation from Parkinson's disease. Well, I would, I would just add a method that doesn't involve the brain but the heart and has, has some utility, uh, and that's um, MIVG or fluorodopamine PET scan. In patients with Parkinson's disease, is always, almost 100% of the patients at least uh, may not be early on, although sometimes it is early on, they have denervation, sympathetic denervation of the heart, Whereas in PSP and in MSA, most patients will have spared innervation of the heart when it's done similar to the DAT scan in the brain. You can do uh, a similar technique in the heart, and instead of looking at dopamine neurotransmission, you look at norepinephrine, um, sympathetic postganglionic norepinephrine neurons. So that's another uh, adjuvant or way that can help distinguish. Parkinson's disease from PSP and MSA. Parkinson's is abnormal, the others are normal, sort of the opposite to what occurs in MRIs mm -hmm. of the brain, right? Okay, thank you very much Horatio for uh, that detailed answer there. Here is our next question. This looks like it may be our last question. So audience members, if you have any other further questions, please send them through that questions window. Um, if not, this will be our last question and it looks like it may be for you Hiba. Uh, this audience member is asking, where are ASIN PET imaging today? Any breakthrough soon? So yes, so um quite exciting news in the past few months where the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, recently announced that they'll be funding AC Immune and this is in particular to actually uh, look at uh, alpha-synuclein PET traces. So certainly this is an exciting bit of news as we, we don't have traces in this at the moment and it affects um, a lot of disorders, not just Parkinson's disease. So that's the, the latest news that we have on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just want to find out, Horatio or um, Heba, do you have any other final words before we close off the Q&A portion of the webinar that you would like to share with our audience? Well, Heba, um, I mean, I can jump, but um, I, I think you should mention something first, right, of all this great work you're doing. I think it's, I think the really the take home message in terms of a clinical and a imaging perspective is really the use of multimodal imaging, but also non-imaging biomarkers. So really combining all of these methodologies and that's what's really going to give us the best indication of subtypes within these Parkinsonian disorders, even distinguishing between them, but also in terms of looking at disease progression. Perfect, Eva. I, I will emphasize the same. I fully agree. The future of clinical trials requires imaging biomarkers. There's no way to do clinical trials of disease-modifying drugs, drugs that can slow the progression without using uh, imaging biomarkers. The, the clinical changes can take longer or take longer and um, particularly in Parkinson's disease, that is a slowly evolving disease, uh, without imaging, the clinical trials become almost impossible. Okay. Thank you very much for those last words. Well, thank you very much for those questions. We have reached the end of the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we couldn't attend to your questions, the team at Exico may follow up with you after this presentation. Now, if you have any further questions, please direct them to the email addresses on your screen. And there it is right there, info at exico.com.
Thank you everyone for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, I'm about to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues when they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that and uh, wait a few seconds. I'll send that to you in a, um, shortly. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers, Horatio and Hiba, for that very detailed and insightful presentation and uh, answering your, your questions. So thank you very much, Horatio and Hiba. Thank you, Sonia. And we have a lot of questions, Hiba, about new techniques and uh, we all look forward to your answers. Okay. Right. Eva? Maybe, maybe another webinar. <laughs> all right, that sounds great. Well, we hope thank you, you found this. Thank you, Sonia. Oh, thank you, Horatio. Thank, thank you, Eva. Thank you. We hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at X Talks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you Sonia. And Eva. Thank you.